morning. Thank you, Jan. Or, I'm sorry, Lois, for that beautiful. I've had looked at somebody else. Uh, for Lois, for that wonderful call to worship. Welcome to Pine Island United Methodist Church this morning. We're glad to have you here. My name's Kaylee Vita, and I'm the pastor here at this church. A few announcements for you. I just want to let you know that we have put the bucket out in the narthex for the change for the children that uh, raises money for the Florida United Methodist Children's Home. So you can find that bucket out there. And then also, we are a drop-off site for school supplies for the Matt Lachey Hookers Back to School Drive. Uh, that is a blue tub you can find out in the narthex. And you can um, find a list of supplies that they're taking and then uh, bring those to church anytime. Welcome to worship this morning, and now um, Marion will open us with a word of prayer. by thanking God for his son Jesus who's the reason we're here and <clears throat> bless this time together and, and may all parts of the service be pleasing to you I pray all this in Jesus name Amen Good morning Can we please rise and I will sing probably the most familiar song ever other than maybe Amazing Grace and that is how great thou art. And we're going to sing all four verses because I don't know how you can pick a verse.
I told someone when I'm concentrating on the music and on the keys, I don't get to look up and see you. So thank you for singing that with me. Next, stay standing. We're going to do Good, Good Father. moment today, um, I want to talk to you about one of the other hats that I wear, not the music, and that is the director of the food program here, the backpacks um, and food for kids. So uh, we're just about ready to start backpacks again. Can I hear an amen from you kids? Yay! <laughs> <laughs> this gang over here are phenomenal, and many of them are missing today because they're elsewhere, but Tracy, you can tell them. You guys come over ready to pack on Sunday night. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and the first thing to do is they run in the door and say, Mr. Terry, Mr. Terry, can I run the sealer? So he gets to be the sealer Nazi. Um, and I have him deal with that for us. I know, I shouldn't have said that word, sorry. Um, uh, inside comments there. Um, 
So he gets to say who runs the sealer, and they go through packing 100 to 130 bags in no time flat. Just an utterly amazing feat. You help make that possible because you help bring food that helps us pack those backpacks. Um, we, we are just off of doing uh, 14, 15 months of supplying grocery bags uh, purchased, packed, and delivered weekly during the COVID uh, pandemic, which we're kind of still in, but thank God we're beyond needing that. Um, we're doing Harry's Helpings on Saturdays from 9 to 11. Um, and I don't see, Marlene is not here today. Marlene Pletcher is there every Saturday morning. Anyone wants to help with that? From 9 to 11, um, contact Marlene. I know she'd love to have some company. But people come and pick up their bag or their box of food from uh, Harry Chapin Food Bank. We also do a mobile food pantry, which we had on Friday. Um, it's still needed. I can't tell you how many people were so thankful. Um, that last lady with the little boy was in tears by the time Terry helped her get everything to her car. Um, that someone would care enough to to give that food to them and we also catered to him because he was the cutest little thing I ever saw um, <laughs> so uh, so that's what we have been doing and we'll continue doing mobile food bank but through the years probably 11 or 12 years now we have provided <coughs> bags of food on Friday at the school to the elementary students to take home and have enough food that's kid friendly that they can fix or open up and eat so we know that they are not going two days without something to eat unfortunately it happens not just on this island it happens everywhere um, I think I remember years ago telling a lady who said there's nobody in our town who is hungry and I said I personally know people within two blocks of you whose children go to bed hungry every night. Um, she became one of our staunchest supporters <laughs> because she believed me and that was true. I was not lying. Um, I did know this family. So what you can do, you can bring kid-friendly foods, no peanut butters, um, granola bars, cheese and crackers. Um, a big thing that's difficult to get right now are the individual cereals. So. Um, most many of the stores have quit providing those um, and so they're harder to buy um, we can't put a big bag of cereal in but those and kids love those little individual boxes so definitely anytime you get something like that that would be great we put in tuna or um, Vienna sausages we put in a box of mac and cheese because no matter what a kid can figure out how to make mac and cheese um, we put in a thing of ramen noodles. They love them. I hate them. They can have them. Um, we put, try to put in pudding or a fruit cup or applesauce, something like that. Um, when possible, we put in candy. Uh, we go to Midwest Food Bank. Uh, Jackie and Terry are frequent flyers at Midwest Food Bank for us, and they often have leftover candy. Um, and so we throw some candy in because we want the kids to want to have this bag. Um, we also let our youthies take home bags if they would like one as well. So um, it's an awesome time. We can always use help with that project. So if you're interested in helping, see Terry or myself and we'll get you signed up to, to come and see if it's something that you want to do. Um, we get it all set up on Sunday night about 6 30 or so and then the kids come over at 7 is that right Am I? yeah 7 it's been so long That's right. it's been two years <laughs> the kids come over at 7 and are done and on the bus going home at 7 30 so um, I guarantee you hanging out with these kids keeps you young um, and it's a lot of fun and you'll learn to love them because we sure have so um, that's what we can use your help with with backpacks so uh, there'll be a there is a bin out back we'll, there'll be one every week bring your things and put them in there if you need us to come and 
empty your car for you, holler, I'll get some strong arms to do that as well. We are going to um, have a special treat for our offertory. Um, but uh, first I want to talk to you about the ways that you can give. Um, obviously you can bring cereal for me. But <laughs> besides that, um, churches have to have money in order to be able to run. Just a fact. You have to have money to be able to run your home. This is God's home. We need to run it properly. You can give through the mail. Send us your tithe. You can tithe through, you can give through the website. You can give on Facebook. There's a, a place. My personal favorite is the Give It Plus app because I make arrangements one time and every week I get a thank you from the church that they got my money, our money. <laughs> and so I don't have to think about it on Sunday morning when I'm busy getting everything else ready to minister to you and to be ministered to. So um, that's my favorite. Um, and your bank can, you can make arrangements through your bank as well, and some people have done that. So there's a variety of ways. We also have offering plates at the back. Um, we aren't passing them yet due to, there are still some issues with COVID, and unfortunately we need to be praying that they don't get any worse than they are. Um, so if you'll bow with me uh, for our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come in person and worship with our friends and our family here. <coughs> we thank you for the opportunity to serve the community um, for this fabulous backpack program that's been in existence for a number of years now and the ability to make sure that children on this island don't go hungry. I ask that you would please bless all the ministries of Pine Island United Methodist Church. Bless those who give. Bless those who are thinking about giving. May we know your will in our life here on the island and in this world. And may we follow what your direction is for us. Um, may we know what our mission is. And please give us the opportunities to seek out new missions and to do those things you would have us to do. We thank you now. We praise you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Our offertory, while they're coming back up and getting ready here, is a familiar face and a not familiar face. <laughs> Jan, remind me, Irma? Irma. Okay. Jan Nyberg, um, for a number of years, was the, mu the music director here and choir director and plays a myriad of instruments. Jan is down for a brief visit. Um, and I said, can we get you to church to play for us? And she brought her friend Irma. So they are going to be playing and singing. Um, these are mountain dulcimers, for anyone who does not know. Um, and they're just a, a beautiful old time instrument. Bev, thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's wonderful to be here and see familiar faces and, and some new ones. And, and it's just really great to be here. We met through playing dulcimers down here in Florida. And both of us deserted Florida. I went back to New York, Irma went back to Kentucky. But you know, we've obviously kept in touch with each other. We attend music festivals together and visit each other. And, we decided it was time for a, a visit to Florida. And so we drove separately in our own cars, but we drove together and we're staying in Buckingham uh, at my son's house. And sometimes she goes her way and I go my way. And sometimes we go together <laughs> and it's been great fun. And we're going to sing a song for you called Anchored in Love. It's a song made famous by the Carter family. It was recorded by them in 1928. And if you happen to know it, sing or hum along.
Now it is time for our children's message. We have no little kids. Okay, but all the big kids, come on up. <laughs> Hi, big kids. <laughs> hey, Waylon. <laughs> A surprise, Yuki. So it's really nice to see you guys. Um, so this, you, you recognize this, right? This is a Bible from the youth building. And you might notice some things about this Bible. It doesn't have a back cover anymore. And I'd like to tell you that this is the only one of them that looks like this, <laughs> but it's not. This, I just grabbed one, and this is what in the front cover is soon to go to, right? And, but you might, so you might think, oh, couldn't you have found one that was in better condition? But I love the fact that this is in, in very good condition because the reason it's like this is that it gets used a lot and it gets read a lot by lots of different kids and different youthies on a regular basis. So then it ends up looking like this. My, my niece um, has a Bible that she's had since, she, she's a grown up now and she has a Bible that she's had since she was like 15 and she always says Genesis is in a baggie <laughs> because her whole book of Genesis fell apart from the rest of the Bible, and it's in a baggie now. So, um, but there are awesome things that you can find when you look in your Bibles, and you know how I always say the best Bible is an open one, right? So, um, one of the things that when we go in our Bibles, we see a lot of are parables. So, how many of you have ever been in the godly playroom with Miss Dawn? Right? Okay. Yep. And you've heard her say, yeah, right? <laughs> and you've heard door people extraordinaire, right? And you've heard her say that every time you open one of those parable boxes, you see and hear something new that you might not have seen or heard before. So I want to talk to you about what a parable is today. A parable is a story that Jesus told to make a point. That's what a biblical parable is. There, you could have parables in regular life too, but in the Bible, there are stories that Jesus told that helped to illustrate a point. And the thing that Jesus talked about a lot was the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Is he wanted to teach people how to be, how to think, how to um, be part of this kingdom because they really didn't get it, right? And he said, the, the disciples asked him, they said, why do you use parables when you talk to the people? Because every time someone would ask him a question, he'd start, he'd start telling a story. And they're like, why don't you just tell us the answer instead of giving us this parable? And Jesus said, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. That is why I use these parables. Now, Jesus wasn't trying to keep secrets from people, but he recognized that there were people who were asking him questions, trying to trip him up, trying to get him to say the wrong thing, trying to just, like, trying to stir up trouble. They weren't really interested in hearing the truth. And Jesus says, when you hear these parables and you listen and you have a heart that wants to hear the truth of them, you will. And all sorts of layers of truth to it 
that you might not even otherwise hear when I tell it, tell it to you this way. And so it's a really cool thing for us to remember when we hear parables. Like today, Pastor Kaylee's gonna talk about one of her favorite parables. And when we hear it, we can hear it in a different way every time in a new detail that we didn't notice before. It kind of comes out to us, right? And we get and we go, oh, wow, I never even thought of it that way before. And it's like a new thing. So I want to encourage you to open up your Bibles and listen to the parables of Jesus. And then when you think you know a parable, you really think you know it, I want you to read it again a little later and go, oh, that too, all right? All right, so let's pray, ready? And by the way, guys, because we um, do not have little kids in our midst today, kids' worship time is gonna be, everybody's just gonna stay right here and worship all together because we don't have any little children to minister to. So all of you guys who would normally help with that, you are welcome to just be part of the, the grown-up worship time today. All right, so ready, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for Jesus and this interesting and unique way of teaching parables. Please help us to desire to read parables and to listen to the words of Jesus that will help us to live in your kingdom in ways that please you. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. to give the morning prayer but first I want to say as a professional author I like seeing books that are dog-eared <laughs> underlined highlighted and used and we professional authors can spot somebody who comes to us with a book that has never been opened <laughs> I think pastors can do that with Bibles too so, <laughs> so please join me in our morning prayer. Dear Lord, we joyously thank you for all the incredible blessings that we have here on Pine Island. Our fellow islanders, our wonderful fruits and seafood, our fascinating natural surroundings, our beautiful sunrises and sunsets and starry skies, our kind and gentle church and our wonderful new pastor. But Lord, our greatest blessing is knowing no matter how badly we falter, how far we stray, how low we fall, how scared or shamed we feel, we are always welcomed back by you. Dear Lord, you know we don't intend to stray from the path, but we do. We don't intend to have doubts in our faith, but sometimes we do. We don't intend to be self-centered, but we sure do get that way. The world around us is pretty short on forgiveness, but thankfully you have forgiveness in infinite supply. Thank you, Lord, for always being there to welcome us back and in the process helping us be a little stronger, a little wiser, and a little kinder than we were before. And at this moment, all God's people say, Amen. 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 And so now let us all say the prayer aloud that Jesus taught us 2,000 years ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Today, we will be reading from Luke 15, 11 to 32. Um, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, <laughs> The younger son told his father, I want my share of the estate now before you die. So his father agreed and divided his wealth between his sons. A few days later, the younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About this time, his money ran out. A great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding to the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When the family came to, when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I'm dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both you, heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. Thank you, Paul and Nicole, for coming out from behind, coming out in front today to read our scripture for us. So last week, we talked about Isaiah 43, 1 through 7. And we discovered that the central message of that text is that God loves us, and God is always with us. God knows our names, and we are precious to God. This is such an important truth to hold on to. And in this week's scripture passage, which was found in the New Testament, it has a very similar message about God. It's a story, as I hope you caught from the way Paul and Nicole read that together. You know, I love stories. I love stories because... I can connect with the characters, and I can place myself in the story. And when I can do that with a story from the Bible, it makes the Bible come alive for me. 
In this story today, it's most commonly known as the parable of the prodigal son. And it's one of those stories. No matter how many times I hear it, I never tire of it. Do any of you know any little kids who have their favorite storybook? You finish that last page and then they just want you to start over again? That's me with this story. I think it's because I can so easily place myself in it. Sometimes I'm the younger brother, sometimes I'm the older brother, but always I'm in the story. I wonder if you can find yourself in the story today. The parable has three characters. It has the younger son, it has the older son, and it has the father. Now, they're all different from each other, but oddly, they have these similarities. Now, they do each have different roles to play. The younger son, he's the obvious rebellious one. He's a blatant rule breaker. He first asks that he get his portion of the inheritance before his father is even dead. And then he goes off to this foreign land, which was Gentile territory and would have been a big no-no for a Jewish man. Then he spends all of his money on wild living, probably breaking more rules. And then he finds himself when every last bit of his money was spent working for a pig farmer, which was an even bigger no-no for a Jewish man. Pigs are unclean according to Jewish law, and Jews are forbidden to eat them or even be around them. The son, he's lost. Now granted, he's lost of his own making, but he is lost nonetheless. Now I don't know about you, but I feel for the guy. I mean, probably because I've been there. I've been that prodigal child who was lost because of my own greed and arrogance, wanting to live according to my own demands. I chose to break the rules and go astray, just like the younger son. And like him, I tried to find happiness and fulfillment from the things of the world, but it didn't work. Like the younger son who was literally starving and empty, I was empty, and I was starving for something more. But then that younger son, he came to his senses. I picture a light bulb coming on over his head or him getting hit over the head with a rubber mallet, like in the cartoons. He remembers his father's house and how good it is that this there, that the servants even have it better than he does. He's experiencing, in this moment, this this starvation he's pining for the pods that the pigs are eating even and he realizes just how far from home that he is he recognizes this is not how he's meant to live it's in that realization that the act of repentance actually begins for him Now, according to the dictionary, the definition of repentance is to turn from sin and dedicate oneself to the amendment of one's life. Now, if this son, if he had stopped here with just this moment of realization, we'd be done. End of story. But thankfully, he doesn't. He actually shows what true repentance looks like. He realizes his faults, and then he gets up and he heads home back to his father. And he does this with no expectation of returning as a son. He realizes that he doesn't deserve that. He returns home humbled, just hoping that he'll be accepted as a servant. He isn't groveling, but he doesn't have any pretenses or a sense of entitlement. And notice how he approaches his father. He refers to him as father, and he says, I'm not worthy to be called your son. He realizes just how disrespectful he has been. You know, all this, this is not unlike my story either. I had this moment of realization that this is not how I'm meant to live. I recognized my disobedience. I turned from my sin and back toward God. I headed home to the father. Now, what about you today? 
Can you identify at all with this younger son? Have you maybe had a time in your own life when you were lost, perhaps of your own making? Did you try to find happiness and fulfillment according to the world's standards? What was your moment of realization? Do you remember? Do you remember what it felt like when you turned back toward home, toward God? Maybe you still identify with that younger son today. Are you right now trying to find happiness out in the world? If so, I do have some questions for you. How is that working for you? Are you fulfilled, living your best life? Or are you maybe empty, starving to death, willing to do just about anything to find a sense of fullness? If this is you, I hope that today will be your moment of realization, that today you will turn toward home, toward the Father. Now, the older son, he seems to be the exact opposite of this younger son. At first glance, he's the good son, the one who's righteous and obedient. He does what is right and follows the rules, or does he? I want to make the case that he, too, is a prodigal, that he's just as lost as the younger son. He perhaps just hides it well. We don't hear much about him in the story until the end. We know that the father divided the property between them, which, according to Jewish law, meant that the eldest got a double portion. In this case, he got two-thirds of the estate. This eldest son, he comes on the scene in verse 25, when he comes home from work. He finds out what's happening, and he is angry. The father goes out to him, but how does he respond to the father? He doesn't even acknowledge their relationship. Remember that the younger son, the first word that he spoke was father. But this elder son, this righteous one, he says, all these years I've served you, I've slaved for you, I've never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. So now let's just stop for a minute there. He's disrespectful to his father, doesn't acknowledge who he is, and then he says that he's been slaving for his father. But that's interesting because the property was already split. That means that really the property was the son's. Now going on, then the, the son, he whines to the father that, the, that he never even got a goat to go and celebrate with his friends. Now, I get it. He'd like to have been acknowledged for his work, for being faithful. I think the problem is his attitude. He's saying these things out of a sense of entitlement, as though he deserves it. He wants justice. I mean, did you hear what he said? Yet when this son of yours, he can't even acknowledge that it's his brother. He says, when this son went out squandering the money on prostitutes. I don't know if you noticed, but prostitutes weren't mentioned in the beginning when we were told that the brother went out. It's said that he went out and... Um, Spend his money in wild living. So first, I wonder, how did he know anything about what his brother had been doing? And then second, why did he need to embellish it? Is he jealous of, what his brother, of his brother because of the party? Sure. Could it be that he's also jealous because his brother went out and actually saw the world? Jealousy can compel us to assume the worst in others and do or say some very hurtful things. This older brother, he's been with the father the entire time, working and doing what we might think is the right thing. He has, by all appearances, been a faithful son. But has he really? It seems to me like he's lost. He's completely missed knowing his father. He's worked not out of love and faithfulness, but out of obligation and yearning. It's easy for me to be hard on this older brother, to pick on him and make him out to be the villain of the story, but that isn't fair. It would mean I'd be picking on myself, too, 
Because if I'm being completely honest with myself, there have been plenty of times in my life that I've been like that older brother. I've acted out of duty instead of out of service. I've been frustrated, even angry, when I didn't get the recognition that I thought I deserved. I remember many years ago feeling this way. In the church that we were part of at the time, I was very involved in women's ministry, in teaching classes and planning events. I was close with many of the pastors on the staff, and they knew about my calling to ministry. But every time that a job opening, they would have a job opening at the church, they wouldn't even ask me if I was interested. Now, the truth is, I probably wouldn't have been interested at the time. But I just really wanted the recognition, the acknowledgement. Now, another thing about this older brother that unfortunately reminds me of myself at times is his tendency toward justice over mercy. He wants what he thinks he deserves, but he also wants his brother to get what he thinks his brother deserves, which, side note, is not a party. <laughs> but you see, the problem is that when we live by justice and merit, we never know the joy of grace. If we demand that God deal with us as we deserve, we cannot share in the grace of God the Father. We can't demand both justice and grace. When we demand justice, we're making demands for our own rights. But when we share in God's grace, we value relationship. Unfortunately, we usually learn to demand our own rights before we learn to value relationships. Now, can you think of a time in your life when you acted as that older brother, valuing your rights, demanding justice over relationships and grace? Are you in that place today? Well, whether you identify with the younger son or the older son, I have some good news. Because there is a character in this story we haven't talked about yet. The father. Now, the younger son, he was an obvious prodigal and rebel. And then I hope that I made the case that the, young, the older son had some rebellion in him that was just hidden behind his righteous living. Now I propose that this father was also a rebel, a rule breaker. But he breaks the rules in a completely different way. First, he actually does divide the estate when his son demands it. That typically wasn't done. Then, when that younger son comes home, which, by the way, means he was watching for him that whole time, he runs out to him. <laughs> that was a completely undignified thing for a grown man to do, to run. But he set aside his dignity because of the complete joy that he felt over seeing that son come down the road. Now, not only does he run, but he pours pure lavishness over this son. He hugs him, he kisses him, which is a sign of his forgiveness for, of him. And then he puts a robe on him, a ring on his finger, and sandals on his feet. And then he throws a party for him. And then finally, that father, he breaks another rule. See, he's the host of that party. He needs to stay in that party with his guests. But he leaves the party to go out to his older son to plead with him to come in. The father turns the attention to his love and his bounty. Just because he threw a party to celebrate that younger son doesn't mean there's nothing left for the older son. As you might guess, the father in this story is like our heavenly father, God. No matter who you are today, the younger son or the older son, God welcomes you. He welcomes you with pure lavishness. God offers you the same scandalous grace the father in the story offered those two sons. Grace that defies all earthly rules and conventions. God doesn't give us what we deserve. God offers us mercy, abundance, love. God welcomes us home with open arms, and here is the best part. Every time God welcomes another prodigal home, it doesn't mean there's less for the rest of us. 
We don't have to worry about there not being enough to go around because, and this is the beauty of God's kingdom, it actually means there's more. More feasting, more music, more and bigger parties. In God's kingdom, there is abundance and extravagance. There's mercy and grace. There's love. The Father waits with open arms. So if you're feeling lost like that younger son today, I hope that you will come to your senses and have a moment of realization. Turn toward home, toward the open arms of God, your Father. Accept the lavish gifts God offers you of mercy, grace, and love. Experience the joy of the celebration of returning home, of being found. If you're feeling more like the older brother today, hear your father pleading with you to come into the party. Don't stand outside and pout any longer. Come in and accept the grace as the rule of life for God's family. Celebrate the fact that there is enough to go around and then some. Grace never runs out in the kingdom of God. Wherever you find yourself, know this. God, our Heavenly Father, is waiting for you. God wants us all to come home. And if you're already there at the party celebrating, wonderful. Won't you help others find their way? Help others find the mercy, the grace, and the love that you know abounds in the kingdom of God. Will you pray with me? God, our Father, we turn to you today and find you waiting. Waiting with open arms to welcome us home. You are our good, good Father, who loves us more than we deserve. Thank you for the gift of your scandalous grace. Amen. Stand with us. We're going to sing four verses of Just As I Am. Um, and as always, our altar is open if anyone feels the need to come and pray.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.
mean, it's it's the same password though. Okay. All right. I'll look at that one sometime this week. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no problem.